Well, hello everyone and welcome to the um, Start Solution Book Club. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, your Start Solution coach, and uh, we're ready to get started. All right. Great. Thank you for being here today. It's all, it was so fun. I look forward to every Saturday to, to meet with you here. I um, just wanted to remind you that I have a Facebook page. If you go to, if you go to uh, Facebook, you can type Dr. Starch, all spelled out, and you'll get to my page. And I hope that you will like it because I post a lot of free um documents and a lot of free resources there also i have a youtube channel if you go to youtube and you type my name gustavo tolosa you will find my channel and if you click on the little bell you'll get a notice every time that i upload a a um, new video and thank you to all of you who have uh, helped me uh, with my first attempt at doing a cooking webinar. I have been cooking uh, plant-based tart center for seven years now. I consider myself a, um, a pretty good uh, plant-based chef. I love, love, love to cook. And I wanted to, uh, I have made many free webinars for you with other chefs and I wanted to do one of my own. And I appreciate that you purchased it. Uh, it is a very um, low, I think, uh, an approachable fee, but it helps me to keep making these free videos and webinars for you. So thank you. I also have a Patreon account in case you wanted to support me that way. All right. So uh, when the email goes out today with a replay, you will have a gift. I will explain to you what it is. And um, I wanted to show you, you know, all throughout these years, I have collected some very interesting slides. So today, before we start, I wanted to share with you some of these slides because um, I think you can get a lot out of these slides. So I'm going to put it here on the screen. Hold on just a minute, and here we go. All right, so I just wanted to show you some of my favorite ways to eat potatoes. These are what we would call steak potatoes, and um, they are baked, but there are ways to make these with different herbs and different, um, um, yeah, different herbs, I guess, and um, to make them come out crisp from the oven. So we will talk about that either in this webinar or in another. You can email me, but I will make a uh, webinar at some point with potato recipes. Um, here is a, a, a double baked potato and that is uh, was baked, then made, um, we mashed it and we put it back in the oven so that it would get brown and a little more crispy and a plain baked potato, which I love. And then mashed potatoes that can be, of course, with anyone, but this one is the red potato with the skin. And these that you can cut, that you can make sort of like a hash brown for breakfast or lunch or dinner. And it has a silicon mat under it so they don't get st stuck. And this is something that I wanted to share because a lot of people think that a plant-based vegan diet is expensive. And it is if you buy a lot of vegan alternative uh, junk food, <laughs> like the ice cream and like some pizzas and, and, and bars and main, you know, mayonnaise and some burgers. It can get expensive. There are uh, vegan cheeses and meats, but that is not what we're about here because here we are about uh, whole, whole foods. When you're talking about whole food, anything that comes in a package is not 
it's usually not whole food. It's whole food and it's plant-based. So it, it has to come from a plant. And ice, there is no ice cream plant or no, ham, or no burger plant, although we can, uh, you know, there's no mayonnaise plant either or tree. So, but if you focus on foods that are very inexpensive, like potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, and rice, uh, with some fruits, and then you throw in some greens. Uh, the, it's really not an expensive way of eating. Actually, you can save a lot of money. Um, here's another slide that I like. Is for those of us, I have to admit that it is very difficult for me to drink water when I'm not thirsty. But um, remember that we actually have, we actually ingest a lot of water with this way of eating because we eat a lot of fruits and vegetable. And look at that, water melon is 96% water and 94% water for the uh, bell peppers and lettuce, uh, strawberries, um, cauliflower. I mean, it's just a lot of water in the food that we eat. Okay, so uh, I wanted to show you the difference between iceberg and romaine lettuce, how one cup is a, it's the same amount of calories, but look at that. The iceberg, the, I'm sorry, the romaine has more fiber. It has more calcium, more potassium, way more vitamin C. Instead of 1.5 milligrams, it has 11 milligrams. Uh, folate, a lot more, a lot more vitamin K, uh, beta carotene, which is something that is very, 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 very important for, for us to stay healthy, is 164 for iceberg and 1,637 for the um, romaine. And then uh, lutein, and I can't pronounce some of these in zeaxanthine. Uh, you know, these are, you can look it up. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these because that, uh, we want to move on to our book. But look at that. You know, this is interesting. Even lettuce, there is a difference between one kind and the other. I'm not saying don't eat iceberg. I'm just saying that we should always be looking for variety, even in lettuce. And here is a a little slide about kale, which I love. I love, love, love kale. Uh, is anti-inflammatory, is anti low calorie, uh, has a lot of antioxidants and uh, has vitamin K and calcium and vitamin C and vitamin, uh, it looks like uh, I cannot read that. Okay, potassium and so forth. So and later on, while you're watching this webinar, you can pause these slides and you can uh, read them in more detail. So we'll stop the presentation here. And um, I hope that you enjoyed those slides. I know they went kind of fast, but um, later you can stop. What about texture vegan protein? We don't um, recommend that. It's a it's, it's, it's way too processed. And so remember that processed, remember this, processed equals no fiber and no water and most of the nutrients gone. Let's take as an example a, um, let's see, um, what could we, Take us an example that would be good. Olives, okay. So an olive has water, has fiber, and has quite a lot of nutrients. When you make olive oil, it has zero water, zero uh, fiber, and most of the nutrients are gone. I knew that before because I had read it. Then I went to a factory and they explain it and they show it as the process. And then I actually saw it. So now I can actually say that it is true. Yeah, that it, most of what's good in an olive is gone. 
So anytime we talk about process, we're talking about taking out what's good and um, and ended up with a product that is uh, way high in calories and it does not have the uh, uh, the fiber that helps us uh, clean out our um, system and it helps us with bulk so that we feel full and it doesn't have water either that also helps with that sense of fulfillment. Okay, but we can talk more about that. So the texture vegan protein is something that we try to stay out. You know, if if you out of if if you eat it once every three four months or something like that, I don't think that you will die of a heart attack. <laughs> um, but it's it's uh, just stay with what we preach here, which is whole food, plant based. Whole food, plant based. Always think about that. Is it whole? Is it close? to the original package that it came in? Um, is it coming from a plant? Like I can actually recognize this thing, a lettuce, a tomato, uh, a bean, uh, the, you know, I can recognize it as coming from plant. Okay, um, and then for us, it needs to have starch. It needs to have a lot of starch. No iron. Do you know how to keep iron extremely low so it does not kill you? Um, yes. Uh, if we eat, like like we have been reading, and if not, go back and, and see the other episodes. Uh, one of the things that Dr. McDougall says and said to me many times is that if we eat this way and we eat a variety of foods, uh, potatoes, the potatoes, different kinds of rice, beans, um, all the legumes, all the uh, green and veggies and all the orange and red and yellow and oh no, all, all a variety, eating the rainbow, like some people say. Um, we will have our needs for iron. Uh, just think of spinach, for example. So all of these foods when they come in in their original package as whole they have everything needed so that there is a synergy there with it's not it's just it doesn't just have a one mineral or one vitamin it comes in with so many we don't even understand how it's all put together at this point um, but we know that it all works out in a beautiful way and when you take a vitamin or a mineral out and you pop it in a pill, it really doesn't work very well. And in some cases, it does you harm. So there is a chapter later on in, in the START Solution where Dr. McDougall talks about supplements and we'll talk about that. Okay, so let's do a little review from last week from chapter seven and where we talked about protein. Please feel free to email me. I always say that um, if we don't cover something in detail here, I can always send you a lot of resources, not from me because I'm not a medical doctor. I am a doctor in music. And here is the disclaimer that appears at the beginning of Dr. McDougall's book. And it appears also in every one of my videos. Whenever somebody is changing their diet, they need to be uh, you know, under the care of a medical doctor, hopefully a medical doctor that knows about plant-based nutrition because uh, plants and food, is a med uh, they are a powerful medicine. And in many cases, your, if you take medication, your medication will be will need to be adjusted, and in many cases, you will get off the medicine, like Dr. McDougall does with his patients when they attend the ten day program. So, um, wanted to say that. And now let's move on to chapter seven with protein, and I'm just going to summarize it a little bit for you. But let's see here. Uh, maybe we can go through it. Mm. 
at the beginning, well, I'll, I will put the screen in just a minute. At the beginning of chapter seven, Dr. McDougall says that the fundamental question here is how much protein do we need and which types are best? That's very important. So, because people talk about protein as if it was something that we could ingest in unlimited amounts. So how much and which types, those are the real questions. Maybe that's something you can uh, ask, you know, or answer when somebody maybe in a malicious way, uh, after they know that you've lost weight and you look great and you are healthy and they ask you, well, you're in a plant-based diet, so you're probably not getting enough protein. Where are you getting your protein from? And you may choose to deflect that by watching Dr. Lyle's video, which I sent it to you last week and I'll send it to you this week. Or you might say, well, uh, do you know how much protein we need and which types? You know, uh, but that usually ends up in an argument and I am not, I'm not in for arguing. But if you like to argue, then this may be a good way to do it. Okay, so Dr. McDougall says in the book, in chapter seven, that uh, most experts agree today that 40 to 60 grams per day of protein is the uh, optimal and that plant protein uh, easily meet uh, the needs that we have. So let's go now and what we're going to do is go to the book. Remember that on Dr. McDougall's website, which is drmcdougall.com, there is a discussion board in which you can go in, it's free of course, and you can read about protein there. Um, Jeff Novick, who is the dietitian, the nutritionist for the program, is usually there and he will um, answer questions and there are articles and answers is given before. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource, the discussion board. So I'm just going to uh, move on. Dr. McDougall says that if plants can satisfy the demands of enormous animals like elephants, uh, cows, hippopotamus, giraffes, wouldn't you think that they that it, you know they would easily meet our own protein needs, and of course the answer is yes. Okay. All unrefined starches and green, yellow, and orange vegetables, it turns out, are perfectly calibrated by natural design to meet our protein needs so long as we eat enough of them to satisfy our energy and caloric requirements. Um, these foods perfectly support peak human nutrition as they have done for eons. Now this I'm going to, you probably saw this already, but you know, if not, take a look at it later. These are very important charts where he compares um, different types of foods. And this is something that interests me here. Despite the well-documented fact that humans can absorb and synthesize all of the amino acids needed to construct complete protein chains from plant food sources, many people continue to believe the misguided notion that one cannot get sufficient high quality protein on a plant-based diet. This doesn't stop with popular opinion. Even revered experts get the protein story wrong, believing that plant proteins are incomplete in amino acids and therefore cannot alone adequately support our protein needs. And the last paragraphs here, all of them are flat out wrong about sufficiency of protein in plant foods. It is a dangerous error. Following their advice predicts a lifetime of sickness, obesity, and premature death for countless people.
Then there is something here about the American Heart Association got it wrong. So they published a um, deceived, you know, a, 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 an article that Dr. McDougall um, found that it was misleading. And so he says, I was alarmed to see this kind of misinformation quoted and published in such a respected journal. So I wrote a letter to the editor correcting this often quoted but incorrect information. And my letter was published in the June 2002 issue of Circulation. And you can actually, if you click here, you could see it. If you have the book, you can also, the, the paper book, you can look for that article. Um, then he says, I forwarded Dr. Millward's email to the American Heart Association, but it remained silent for almost a decade before softening its position on amino acids. Currently, and this is 2011, the American Heart Association makes the following two statements, echoing the points, points I tried to make back in 2001. And this is what they say, you do not need to eat foods from animals to have enough protein in your diet. Wouldn't this be a wonderful page, maybe you can make a photocopy, to carry around? And, but you know, when people are not ready to change and when you tell them bad news about their habits, their eating habits, um, they're not gonna, no matter how much proof you bring, they're not gonna, most of the times they will not listen. I'm sorry to say, but sometimes they may. So if you have someone that is really wanting to listen and change their way of eating, this might do it. You might tell them that the American Heart Association now uh, recommends and or says that you don't need to eat foods from animals to have enough protein in your diet. You can actually find this article by clicking here. Plant proteins alone can provide enough of the essential and non-essential amino acids as long as sources of dietary protein are varied. And that's very important. A variety in our diet and caloric intake is high enough to meet energy needs. So if you're eating 500 calories a day, then you're not going to get enough protein. But on a regular 2,000, 500, 3,000 calorie diet, you will, according to Dr. McDougall. Whole grains, legumes, vegetable seeds, and nuts all contain both essential and non-essential amino acids. You don't need to consciously combine these foods and think, okay, I'm going to combine this one with that one because you have to complement this protein. No, 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 no. Within a meal, it's combined. We just, we talked about how nature is wise and everything is done, was made, it's perfect. At last, the American Heart Association has accepted the scientifically proven conclusion that plant foods do indeed contain all of the essential amino acids we need to survive and thrive. Unfortunately, though, experts from Tufts, Harvard, Northwestern, and most other major universities and media, medical organizations have chosen to continue spreading incorrect information, the result being serious health consequences for billions of people worldwide. Now you may ask why? Well, there are many answers to that question. We may get to that in another webinar. All right, so um, I think that we went through this. Um, Okay, what you don't know can make you sick. Uh, just think that um, there are the result 
like he says here, the people we trust to educate our children and from our public policies appear to be ignorant about our basic nutritional needs. The result is disastrous. If we have uh, 18 million people with coronary heart disease, more than 25 million people with type 2 diabetes, 400,000 with multiple sclerosis, and millions with inflammatory arthritis. So, unfortunately, like Dr. McDougall writes here, your doctor or even the Surgeon General probably will not tell you about this solution. The solution is that a starch-based diet can help to drastically improve our nation's health and reduce the exorbitant health care bill. One reason is the misguided fear that such a diet would bring about protein deficiency, but protein deficiency does not exist, okay? Just ask any doctor. Protein deficient doesn't exist unless you're talking about starvation, a condition under which all nutrients, including calories, are inadequately supplied. If you eat enough calories, there is no protein deficiency. This is what Dr. McDougall says over and over and over again. And many of the other doctors that I have interviewed in my seven years uh, say the same thing. All right, so this is a star McDougaller. You can read her story. And now we're gonna move on to chapter eight, but before we do that, I have another little surprise here. Okay, so here we go. We, I'm gonna show you some uh, interesting uh, slides. I'm gonna move them on, okay. All right, here we go. Look at this slide here. Do you really need meat to get protein? Look at this. Beef, 6.4 grams of protein per 100 calories. Broccoli, 11.1, .1, almost double. <laughs> Plants have all the protein you need with none of the violence. You may want to share this, take a picture of it, okay? Or just write it down. Remember, you can forward this video to your family and friends. That way you are not the one talking. They can watch it. Okay, here we go. All right. This is a picture I took from one of the many uh, conferences and lectures that I attend whenever possible. And I thought this was very interesting because we have 10 sources of veggie protein. Look at spinach. I mean, everything, everything has protein. But look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. Eggs. 12% compared to spinach and kale and broccoli that have more than 40%. Chicken, 23, and it's protein that is contaminated, I might add. Okay, beef. All right, very, very eye-opening to just see it in a picture. 100 grams of beef versus 100 grams of beans. Look at this. They both have approximately the same amount of protein. The only difference is that beef has zero fiber and beans have 15 grams of fiber. Iron, that one of you were asking, beef has 1.9. Beans have five milligrams. Calcium, look at that. 
almost enough. I mean, 16 milligrams in the beef and 123 milligrams in the, cal in the beans. Magnesium. Zero cholesterol in beans, which is really, really bad for our um, heart health. 74 milligrams of cholesterol in beef. About, well, I don't know when this slide was made, but the, the, the differences are probably around the same now if you take it into consideration the different years. But I mean, way more expensive to buy beef than to buy beans. How much water did it take to make 100 grams of beef. 100 grams of beef is very little. This is information you can actually get. You can go to the internet and type how much water is it needed to raise, to, to end up with 100 grams of beef. 1,480 liters of water, as opposed to 103. We're killing our planet. We're destroying it if we continue eating meat the way people are eating nowadays in uh, unmeasured amounts. Protein-rich vegetables. Look at this. All these vegetables have plenty of protein. Remember that we only need 40 to 60. In the McDougall diet, it may go up to 80. You don't need 400 uh, grams of protein. Why? Well, we saw the damage that it does to our liver and to our kidneys and other areas of our bodies. Green peas, alfalfa sprouts, Brussels sprouts, artichokes, spinach, mustard greens, sweet corn, broccoli. Wow, arugula, watercress, asparagus, and more even. All that, those are rich, rich, rich in protein. Peanuts, hemp seeds, almonds, all these nuts and seeds are rich in protein as well. And of course, I always like to end up with the perfect potato because the potato is just one of those super, um, you know, um, foods. Okay, very good. So let's go back here and see your the chat um should we take a protein powder if we're working out with weights um i will ask and i will have that for you i for what i see uh, athletes do that i i know some they don't um they increase the foods that have protein but let me ask and I, because I don't like to fake an answer, I'm a, I am a, a, a teacher, a professor, and I hate it. Uh, I've never stood in front of a classroom and made up an answer because I thought that I was going to be embarrassed. It's in, there's, so I like to say, if I don't know the correct answer, I like to say I don't know, but I know where to get it, and I will ask, okay? Okay. Um, very good. Very good. So let's move on to our um, presentation here. But I want to make sure that I disappear. <laughs> and OK, so the next question, I, I think Dr. McDougall here is being um, very positive <laughs> and thinking that you will convince your family and friends. I am not a negative person, but I have seen it many, many, many times. Like I mentioned, I think in our first session, uh, many of these doctors and chefs and people that you know and admire in the world of plant-based uh, eating, their own family and friends, and these are the experts of the experts, so don't believe them and don't follow their advice. So. Why would your family and friends follow your advice? You're just one of them. You know nothing, okay? So, but if you've managed to convince your family and friends, in, I, instead of putting once, I'm going to put if, you've convinced your family and friends that you will not perish 
you're not going to die from lack of protein on a starch-based and plant-based diet. They will likely fire your next most common <laughs> question, and that is, oh my gosh, how will you get enough calcium? You won't be able to even stand up straight in a few months. You're just going to disintegrate. You need milk and cheese. That's where the calcium comes from. Well, it turns out that those facts are what the dairy industry would like us to believe. And I have believed them. And Dr. McDougall says, please don't feel bad about having been gullible enough to believe this carton, carton of untruths. I did too, right up until I began to probe a little deeper into the science of calcium and milk. So misinformation builds profits, not bones. The American cow-based dairy industries, milk, yogurt, cheese, ice cream, and the like together make up 100 billion. And this is a book that is a few years old, 100 billion a year business. That gives them plenty of income to support the approximately 202 million they have to spend on their own scientific research and other propaganda each year to spread the myth that dairy foods are not only a healthy choice, but are essential to avoiding illness. So the dairy industry tells us to meet calcium recommendations, increased consumption of calcium rich foods such as milk and other dairy foods often is necessary. Unfortunately, few Americans consume sufficient calcium, thereby increasing the risk for major chronic diseases such as osteoporosis. Just think that 18% of the industry's marketing budget is aimed at school children. Well, <laughs> a talking cow would, would not lie to you, would she? So here's a little bit of humor. Dr. McDougall remembering Elsie the cow that taught him how milk builds strong bones. Then when he moved to Hawaii as a young doctor, there was Lani Mu who took over, <laughs> assuring me that I would never outgrow my need for milk. So here comes the thing that I think we should ingrain in our heads. Calcium comes from dirt, <laughs> not from cows. Where do the cow where do where does the cow get the calcium from? Do you think the cow produces it? No. No, no, no. The cow doesn't produce the calcium. Actually, she gets it from the soil. Calcium is a basic basic mineral element and and get this that is neither created nor destroyed. We can't create calcium. It was created in you know it was created and it cannot be destroyed plants absorb calcium and other minerals through from the soil through their roots and then as the plant grows the calcium is built into its fabric from root to stem to fruit to vegetable seed and the calcium gets into the cow when the cow eats grass and other calcium rich plants so <laughs> I love, love, love this sentence. We need to just memorize this, okay? Skip the cow. Go straight to the plant source for your calcium. Skip the cow. Get the pure calcium without, without the, you know, the cholesterol, uh, without the hormones without the antibiotics. You just get it pure where it comes from, where the cow got it from. Plants are the source of calcium and minerals that build strong bones for humans, cows, and also the largest walking animals on the earth, horses, hippopotamuses, 
okay, and uh, giraffes, and just name it. These animals don't, uh, uh, you know, they don't eat meat or dairy. So if the giants of the animal kingdom can get all the calcium they need to support their massive bones with no help from milk beyond their own mother's milk during their infancy, wouldn't you think plants would provide enough for us relatively small humans? In fact, they do. And here comes the other thing that just opened my, my eyes when I, many years ago, when I was learning all this. Really, you know, the problem is not uh, getting the calcium, because you get it from so many different sources. The problem is how to hold on to it. That's that's the real thing. That's the real problem. It's not finding a way to get enough calcium through what we eat. A plant-based diet of starches, vegetables, and fruits will always give you plenty of it. The problem is holding on to that calcium. So once you understand this, you can see that the logical answer is not is not to increase calcium intake through eating dairy or taking supplements. The best way to increase your calcium retention is to steer clear from animal proteins, including those found in hard cheese and other dairy foods. And I think last week, or maybe it was the week before last, we were reading how when you have extra amounts of protein in your body, um, and you're eating animal food, which is very acidic, you know, the body um, will and try, will, will make will, all the efforts possible to eliminate this. Uh, and it will take calcium out of your bones. So you're literally peeing your bones. All right, so calcium is good. We just don't need so much. Same, same, same message as protein. Protein is good. We need it. We just don't need so much or unlimited amounts. I don't mean to suggest that calcium is unimportant, he says. It is essential for all living things. It is the most abundant mineral found in the human body. We, we carry about 2.2 pounds of it. And about 99% of, of that is stored as calcium phosphate salts in the bones. So it's crucial. It's crucial for uh, forming the skeleton to regulating the nervous system and blood vessel function. All right, so I'm going to put a pause here because I want to show you some more interesting slides. Okay, so... Look at the calcium. You can get calcium from all these sources. Uh, fortified plant milk, we'll talk about that in a minute. Orange or orange juice that freshly made. Kale, collards, broccoli, um, almonds, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. That's why if we eat a, a varied, um, if we have variety in our eating, calcium is everywhere. Look at this. This is very interesting. Look at the bottle. The bottle has different kinds of plant milk. At the very bottom, you have cow, which is obviously not a plant milk. So uh, cow has 103 calories per cup. But look at cashew milk or almond milk, only 25 calories or 36 calories. Look at the protein. Milk has 8.2 grams. Almond milk, which I love, is, is 1.4. Rice is even less. It's 0 0.3. Remember that we need to actually be careful with the intake of protein. All right. Why? Okay, we discussed it last week in the protein um, chapter. Look at fat. For those of you that sometimes wonder, am I, have, am I eating enough fat? Yes, look, cow provides 2.4. It's just that this fat has cholesterol. And the other ones here, like um, let's say almond milk, 
has even a little bit more of fat, but this is healthy fats. Do you want less? Well, you go to with cashew. Okay, but look how the fat is pretty much uh, the same, whether it, co it comes from a from an animal or from a plant. It's just that it's much much healthier when it doesn't come with hormones and antibiotics and cholesterol and things like that. Magnesium. Look at all the sources for magnesium. Chia seeds and flax seeds. I think those are things that you need to add to your oatmeal every morning or at night whenever you eat it. Or in other, uh, you know, you can add those in, in salad dressings to make them, um, uh, to give them that, um, what do you call it, the, the texture of, of, um, of oil, let's say, even though it's not oil. Cashew, almonds, spinach, banana, oats, peanuts. Oh, my goodness, there's magnesium everywhere. Okay. All right. I thought this was fun. Look, a three-ingredient vegan Nutella because I, I, whenever possible, I like to give you some recipes as well. One cup of hazelnuts, one tablespoon of cocoa powder, 12 dates, obviously without the, uh, the um, just the dates, what do you call it, without the, the seed, and one cup of water. And you preheat your oven to 360, uh, you roast the hazelnuts for 15 minutes, you blend the hazelnuts in your food processor until smooth, and then you add the dates and the cocoa powder. Add water until desired consistency is reached, reached, and you have some amazing vegan Nutella using no animal products. And look at this perfect hummus. No, that's not oil. It's tahini, which you can take out. I usually don't use tahini, not because it's bad. It's just that uh, I can look at tahini and gain weight. My body uh, just, uh, it's always been that way. I gain weight easily. So I try not to add things uh, that have fat, even if they're, even if it's good fat, because I gain, I can gain weight. And so whenever I can avoid it, I've learned how to make very creamy hummus without tahini. But of course, tahini is going to make it very creamy and oily without actually using processed oil. So you get a can of chickpeas or you make your own. I don't use cans anymore. I make my own. I cook my own. You get two garlic, garlic cloves. I usually put more than that. One juice, juiced lemon. Sometimes if the lemon is big, I don't use the whole lemon, but it depends how much lemon you like. And the cumin is important for tahini. And I usually don't put salt, but you can put salt. And so um, I just put everything pretty much in my food processor and I process it until I get the desired texture. I thought this was interesting. If you ever need to substitute eggs, um, look at this. Ground flax seeds can substitute. We use that to substitute egg. Chia seeds also. Soy protein, which I don't recommend. Uh, agar, which is sometimes is not easy to find. Ripe bananas, if you are making a, a bread or a muffin. Applesauce, same thing. And peanut butter, which I try to stay awake also for the caloric content. But you can, uh, those are things you can use to substitute eggs. Okay, and then very important that we, we continue to, to educate ourselves. Sometimes people ask me what movies I recommend. Well, here you go. I love Cowspiracy and What the Health. Um, the movie that brought me to this is Forks Over Knives. Uh, I think that's, um, that pretty much started the whole thing, the movement and it's still out there, and there's a website you might want to go look for, 
Uh, and um, anyway, I'm not going to read everyone, but keep this in mind. And when someone asks you about what you're doing, maybe instead of you explaining, you might say, why don't you uh, take a look at forks over knives and then tell me what you think about it. Okay, we're getting close to our time. Actually, it is the end. And um, we will continue with chapter eight next week and then move on to, to the next one. So the assignment for next week is to really reread this chapter eight, maybe even seven. And those are crucial chapters and move on to chapter nine. I have a little surprise and we will end. The surprise is to show you a video um, when I was um, still overweight um, or obese, depending on what year it was. Um, but in the year 2008, I started a nonprofit organization called Musical Angels, which is still alive and working. Musical Angels is an organization uh, that provides free music lessons to hospitalized children, some of them in um, life-threatening conditions. We provide teachers. I was one of them for many years. Um, and we provide teachers that go inside the hospital. We go through all of the training that is required in the hospital. And then we go through the musical angels training, which I provide. And we go inside the hospital, the music therapist or the child life uh, office will, the day before gives us the list of the patients that we can see. And we give them a piano lesson or a guitar lesson in their room, or if they can go to another place, uh, in another place, but it's usually they're confined to the room. And we go there week after week after week. We treat them as if they're not sick, and we have fun. We give them assignment. We leave the instruments for them to practice and to have something to look forward to. And one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me at the beginning I couldn't believe it and I got used to it is when I was teaching a lesson to a little boy or a little girl and the doctor came in to do some kind of procedure and every single time the doctors would tell me, oh, no, no, I'll come back later. You finish what you're doing because what you're doing is more important. And I was shocked. I mean, I knew for being a professional musician that music is very powerful and I saw things that are short for a miracle that I can tell you later. But one of these hospitals in Dallas featured us in their website and made, uh, they brought a, a, a film crew and they made a video about this. So you would see me that I have quite a few pounds extra, extra pounds, but I wanted to show you this video, it's fun. Okay, um, we still have a Facebook page, it's called Musical Angels. If you want to see other information there and I say goodbye to all of you it's been a pleasure I'll see you next week stay in contact it won't bother me if you send me an email to bornforhealth at gmail.com b-o-r-n then the number four h-e-a-l-t-h bornforhealth at gmail.com and I will play the video for you Since I have seen firsthand the power that music has, uh, the healing power in many levels, psychological even and physical, um, I wanted to, uh, to do something for the kids. I have a little pony. First, the, the name came almost immediately to my mind, Musical Angels, because, um, well, having children, you know, you see them and, and they really are little angels on, on, on this planet. Holy. Very good. To Baylor, we come to our children's house twice a week. One day a week is for the group uh, lessons. Another day a week is when I come and I do the private piano lessons. All the, and then three, 
And the, the goal, the idea is to be here at least five days a week. I think that was great for me in your first lesson. <laughs> it helps them have something positive uh, during the day to do. And only that, but because this program is week by week, uh, they have something to look forward to. So when I open that door and I go to see them and they're all of a sudden there's a big smile and they want to show me. I want to show you what I did this week. That's right, you did it. I got to play the piano with Gustavo and it was very fun. My first time, but it was fun and I want to do it again. Yeah, <laughs> good job. There are a lot of things inside them that uh, we, have, we have all felt it that sometimes we can't find words to express something, maybe gratitude, maybe joy. But through music, we get to a higher level of expression. Very good, you're doing it all by yourself. It also builds their self-esteem when they get a little song and they're struggling with it, but after I show them how to do it and practice it, they master it and they just, you know, I feel so proud of what they've accomplished and then we build on that. Very good. And a few times I've been in the room and having a lesson and a doctor has come in and, and uh, he has said, wow, well, what's that smile? I've never seen that smile on your face, you know? And I'm saying, well, it's because, you know, the power of music. Okay. <laughs>